The Matchmaker by H. H. Munro, Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. The Matchmaker by Saki. The grill-room clock struck eleven with the respectful unobtrusiveness of one whose mission in life is to be ignored, when the flight of time should really have rendered abstinence and migration imperative, the lighting apparatus would signal the fact in the usual way. Six minutes later Clovis approached the supper-table in the blessed expectancy of one who has dined sketchily and long ago. "'I'm starving,' he announced, making an effort to sit down gracefully and read the menu at the same time. "'So I gathered,' said his host, "'from the fact that you were nearly punctual. "'I ought to have told you that I'm a food reformer. "'I've ordered two bowls of bread and milk and some health biscuits. "'I hope you don't mind.' Clovis pretended afterwards that he didn't go white, above the collar line for the fraction of a second all the same he said you ought not to joke about such things there really are such people i've known people who've met them to think of all the adorable things there are to eat in the world and then go through life munching sawdust and being proud of it they're like the flagellants of the middle ages who went about mortifying themselves they had some excuse, said Clovis. They did it to save their immortal souls, didn't they? You needn't tell me that a man who doesn't love oysters and asparagus and good wines has got a soul, or a stomach either. He simply got the instinct for being unhappy highly developed. Clovis relapsed for a few golden moments into tender intimacies with a succession of rapidly disappearing oysters. "'I think oysters are more beautiful than any religion,' he resumed presently. "'They not only forgive our unkindness to them, they justify it. "'They incite us to go on being perfectly horrid to them. "'Once they arrive at the supper-table, they seem to enter thoroughly into the spirit of the thing. "'There's nothing in Christianity or Buddhism that quite matches the sympathetic unselfishness of an oyster. Do you like my new waistcoat? I'm wearing it for the first time tonight. It looks like a great many others you've had lately, only worse. New dinner waistcoats are becoming a habit with you. They say one always pays for the excesses of one's youth. Mercifully, that isn't true about one's clothes. My mother is thinking of getting married. Again, it's the first time. Of course, you ought to know I was under the impression that she'd been married once or twice at least. Three times, to be mathematically exact. I mean that it was the first time she'd thought about getting married. The other time she did it without thinking. As a matter of fact, it's really I who am doing the thinking for her in this case. You see, it's quite two years since her last husband died. You evidently think that brevity is the soul of widowhood. Well, it struck me that she was getting moped and beginning to settle down, which wouldn't suit her a bit. The first symptoms that I noticed was when she began to complain that we were living beyond our income. All decent people live beyond their incomes nowadays and those who aren't respectable live beyond other people's. A few gifted individuals manage to do both. It's hardly so much a gift as an industry. The crisis came, returned Clovis, when she suddenly started the theory that late hours were bad for one, and wanted me to be in by one o'clock every night. Imagine that sort of thing for me, who was eighteen on my last birthday. "'on your last two birthdays to be mathematically exact. "'Oh, well, that's not my fault. "'I'm not going to arrive at nineteen as long as my mother remains at thirty-seven. 
one must have some regard for appearances. Perhaps your mother would age a little in the process of settling down. That's the last thing she'd think of. Feminine reformations always start in on the failings of other people. That's why I was so keen on the husband idea. Did you go as far as to select the gentleman, or did you merely throw out a general idea and trust to the force of suggestion? If one wants a thing done in a hurry, one must see to it oneself. I found a military johnny hanging around on the loose end at the club and took him home to lunch once or twice. He'd spent most of his life on the Indian frontier building roads and relieving famines and minimising earthquakes and all that sort of thing that one does do on frontiers. He could talk sense to a peevish cobra in fifteen native languages and probably knew what to do if you found a rogue elephant on your croquet lawn. But he was shy and diffident with women. I told my mother privately that he was an absolute woman-hater, so of course she laid herself out to flirt all she knew, which isn't a little. And was the gentleman responsive? I hear he told someone at the club he was looking out for a colonial job, with plenty of hard work for a young friend of his, so I gather that he has some idea of marrying into the family. You seem destined to be a victim of the Reformation, after all. Clovis wiped the trace of Turkish coffee and the beginnings of a smile from his lips, and slowly lowered his dexter eyelid, which being interpreted probably means, I don't think. End of The Matchmaker by H. H. Munro Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London The Mirror by Catul Mendez This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There once was a kingdom where mirrors were unknown. They had all been broken and reduced to fragments by order of the queen, and if the tiniest bit of looking-glass had been found in any house, she would not have hesitated to put all the inmates to death with the most frightful tortures. Now for the secret of this extraordinary caprice. The queen was dreadfully ugly, and she did not wish to be exposed to the risk of meeting her own image, and knowing herself to be hideous, it was a consolation to know that other women at least could not see that they were pretty. You may imagine that the young girls of the country were not at all satisfied. What was the use of being beautiful if you could not admire yourself? They might have used the brooks and lakes for mirrors, but the queen had foreseen that and had hidden all of them under closely joined flagstones. Water was drawn from wells so deep that it was impossible to see the liquid surface, and shallow basins must be used instead of buckets, because in the latter there might be reflections. Such a dismal state of affairs, especially for the pretty coquettes, who were no more rare in this country than in others. The queen had no compassion, being well content that her subjects should suffer as much annoyance from the lack of a mirror as she felt at the sight of one. However, in a suburb of the city there lived a young girl called Jacinta, who was a little better off than the rest thanks to her sweetheart, Valentin. For if someone thinks you are beautiful and loses no chance to tell you so, he is almost as good as a mirror. Tell me the truth, she would say. What is the color of my eyes? They are like dewy forget-me-nots. And my skin is not quite black. You know that your forehead is whiter than freshly fallen snow, and your cheeks are like blush roses. How about my lips? Cherries are pale beside them. And my teeth, if you please. Grains of rice are not as white. But my ears, should I be ashamed of them? Yes, if you would be ashamed of two little pink shells among your pretty curls. And so on endlessly. She delighted. He still more charmed, for his words came from the depth of his heart, and she had the pleasure of hearing herself praised, and he the delight of seeing her. So their love grew more deep and tender every hour, and the day that he asked her to marry him she blushed certainly, but it was not with anger. 
but unluckily the news of their happiness reached the wicked queen whose only pleasure was to torment others and jacinta more than anyone else on account of her beauty a little while before the marriage jacinta was walking in the orchard one evening when an old crone approached asking for alms but suddenly jumped back with a shriek as if she had stepped on a toad crying heavens what do i see what is the matter my good woman what is it you see tell me the ugliest creature i ever beheld then you are not looking at me said jacinta with innocent vanity alas yes my poor child it is you i have been a long time on this earth but never have i met any one so hideous as you what am i ugly a hundred times uglier than i can tell you but my eyes they are sort of a dirty gray but that would be nothing if you had not such an outrageous squint my complexion it looks as if you had rubbed coal dust on your forehead and cheeks my mouth it is pale and withered like a faded flower my teeth if the beauty of teeth is to be large and yellow i never saw any so beautiful as yours but at least my ears they are so big so red and so misshapen under your coarse elf locks that they are revolting i am not pretty myself but i should die of shame if mine were like them after this last blow the old witch having repeated what the queen had taught her hobbled off with a harsh croak of laughter leaving poor jacinta dissolved in tears prone on the ground beneath the apple trees nothing could divert her mind from her grief i am ugly i am ugly she repeated constantly it was in vain that valentin assured and reassured her with the most solemn oaths let me alone you're lying out of pity i understand it all now you never loved me you're only sorry for me the beggar woman had no interest in deceiving me it is only too true i am ugly i do not see how you can endure the sight of me to undeceive her he brought people from far and near every man declared that jacinta was created to delight the eyes even the women said as much though they were less enthusiastic but the poor child persisted in her conviction that she was a repulsive object and when valentin pressed her to name the wedding day i your wife cried she never i love you too dearly to burden you with a being so hideous as i am you can fancy the despair of the poor fellow so sincerely in love he threw himself on his knees he prayed he supplicated she answered still that she was too ugly to marry him what was he to do the only way to give the lie to the old woman and prove the truth to jacinta was to put a mirror before her but there was no such thing in the kingdom and so great was the terror inspired by the queen that no workman dared make one well i shall go to court said the lover in despair harsh as our mistress is she cannot fail to be moved by the tears and the beauty of jacinta she will retract for a few hours at least this cruel edict which has caused our trouble it was not without difficulty that he persuaded the young girl to let him take her to the palace she did not like to show herself and asked of what use would be a mirror only to impress her more deeply with her misfortune but when he wept her heart was moved and she consented to please him what is all this said the wicked queen who are these people and what do they want your majesty you have before you the most unfortunate lover on the face of the earth do you consider that a good reason for coming here to annoy me have pity on me what have i to do with your love affairs if you would permit a mirror the queen rose to her feet trembling with rage who dares to speak to me of a mirror she said grinding her teeth do not be angry your majesty i beg of you and deem you to hear me this young girl whom you see before you so fresh and pretty is the victim of a strange delusion she imagines that she is ugly well said the queen with a malicious grin she is right i never saw a more hideous object jacinta at these cruel words thought she would die of mortification doubt was no longer possible she must be ugly her eyes closed she fell on the steps of the throne in a deadly swoon but valentin was affected very differently he cried out loudly that her majesty must be mad to tell such a lie he had no time to say more the guards seized him and at a sign from the queen the headsman came forward he was always beside the throne for she might need his services at any moment do your duty 
said the queen, pointing out the man who had insulted her. The executioner raised his gleaming axe just as Jacinta came to herself and opened her eyes. Then two shrieks pierced the air. One was a cry of joy, for in the glittering steel Jacinta saw herself so charmingly pretty, and the other a scream of anguish, as the wicked soul of the queen took flight, unable to bear the sight of her face in the impromptu mirror. End of the Mirror by Catul Mendez The Mistress of Sydenham Plantation by Sarah Orne Jewett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Mistress of Sydenham Plantation by Sarah Orne Jewett. A high wind was blowing from the water into the Beaufort streets, a wind with as much reckless hilarity as March could give to her breezes, but soft and spring-like, almost early summer-like in its warmth. In the gardens of the old southern houses that stood along the bay, roses and pettisborum trees were blooming with their delicious fragrance. It was the time of wisterias and wild white lilies of the last yellow jasmines and the first cherokee roses it was the saturday before easter sunday in the quaint churchyard of old st helena's church a little way from the bay young figures were busy among the graves with industrious gardening at first sight one might have thought that this pretty service was rendered only from loving sentiments of loyalty to one's ancestors for under the great live oaks the sturdy brick walls about the family burying places and the gravestones themselves were moss-grown and ancient-looking yet here and there the wounded look of the earth appealed to the eye and betrayed a new-made grave the old sarcophagi and heavy tablets of the historic beaufort families stood side by side with plain wooden crosses the armorial bearings and long epitaphs of the one and the brief lettering of the other suggested the changes that had come with the war to these families yet somehow the wooden cross touched one's heart with closer sympathy the padlocked gates to the small enclosures stood open while gentle girls passed in and out with their easter flowers of remembrance on the high churchyard wall and great gate-posts perched many a mocking-bird and the golden light changed the twilight under the live oaks to a misty warmth of colour the birds began to sing louder the grey moss that hung from the heavy boughs swayed less and less and gave the place a look of pensive silence in the church itself most of the palms and rose branches were already in place for the next day's feast and the old organ followed a fresh young voice that was being trained for the easter anthem the five doors of the church were standing open on the steps of that eastern door which opened midway up the side aisle where the morning sun had shone in upon the white faces of a hospital in war time in this eastern doorway sat two young women i was just thinking one was saying to the other that for the first time mistress sydenham has forgotten to keep this day you know that when she has forgotten everything and everybody else she has known when easter came and has brought flowers to her graves has she been more feeble lately do you think asked the younger of the two mamma saw her the other day and thought that she seemed more like herself but she looked very old too she told mamma to bring her dolls and she would give her some bits of silk to make them gowns poor mamma and she had just been wondering how she could manage to get us ready for summer this year celestine and me and the speaker smiled wistfully it is a mercy that the dear old lady did forget all that happened and the friends brushed some last bits of leaves from their skirts and rose and walked away together through the churchyard the ancient church 
waited through another easter even with its flowers and long memory of prayer and praise the great earthquake had touched it lightly time had colored it softly and the earthly bodies of its children were gathered near its walls in peaceful sleep from one of the high houses which stood fronting the sea with their airy balconies and colonnades had come a small slender figure like some shy dark thing of twilight out into the bright sunshine the street was empty for the most part before one or two of the cheap german shops a group of men watched the little old lady step proudly by she was a very stately gentlewoman for one so small and thin she was feeble too and bending somewhat with the weight of years but there was true elegance and dignity in the way she moved and those who saw her persons who shuffled when they walked and boast loudly of the fallen pride of the south were struck with sudden deference and admiration behind the lady walked a gray-headed negro a man who was troubled in spirit who sometimes gained a step or two and offered an anxious but quite unheeded remonstrance he was a poor tottering old fellow he wore a threadbare evening coat that might have belonged to his late master thirty years before the pair went slowly along the bay street to the end of a row of new shops and the lady turned decidedly toward the water and approached the ferry steps her servitor groaned aloud but waited in respectful helplessness there was a group of negro children on the steps employed in the dangerous business of crab fishing at the foot in his flat-bottomed boat sat a wondering negro lad who looked up in apprehension at his passengers the lady seemed like a ghost old peter with whose scorn of modern beings and their ways he was partially familiar old peter was making frantic signs to him to put out from shore but the lady's calm desire for obedience prevailed and presently out of the knot of idlers that gathered quickly one more chivalrous than the rest helped the strange adventurers down into the boat it was the fashion to laugh and joke in beaufort when anything unusual was happening before the eyes of the younger part of the colored population but as the ferryman pushed off from the shore even the crab-fishers kept awestruck silence and there were speechless open mouths and much questioning of eyes that showed their whites in vain somehow or other before the boat was out of hail long before it had passed the first bank of raccoon oysters the tide being at the ebb it was known by fifty people that for the first time in more than twenty years the mistress of the old sydenham plantation on st helena's island had taken it into her poor daft head to go to look after her estates her crops and her people everybody knew that her estates had been confiscated during the war that her people owned it themselves now in three and five and even twenty acre lots that her crops of rice and sea island cotton were theirs planted and hoed and harvested on their own account all these years she had forgotten sydenham and the live oak avenue and the outlook across the water to the hunting islands where the deer ran wild she had forgotten the war she had forgotten her children and her husband except that they had gone away the graves to which she carried easter flowers were her mother's and her father's graves and her life was spent in a strange dream old peter sat facing her in the boat the ferryman pulled lustily at the oars and they moved quickly along in the ebbing tide the ferryman longed to get his freight safely across he was in a fret of discomfort whenever he looked at the clear-cut eager face before him in the stern how still and straight the old mistress sat where was she going he was awed by her presence and took refuge as he rode in needless talk about the coming of the sand-flies and the great drumfish to beaufort waters but peter had clasped his hands together and bowed his old back as if he did not care to look anywhere but at the bottom of the boat peter was still groaning softly 
the old lady was looking back over the water to the row of fine houses the once luxurious summer homes of retz and barnwells of many a famous household now scattered and impoverished the ferryman had heard of more one than bereft lady or gentleman who lived in seclusion in the old houses he knew that peter still served a mysterious mistress with exact devotion while most of the elderly colored men and women who had formed the retinues of the old families were following their own affairs far and wide oh lord old oh, miss what can i go to do mumbled peter with his head in his hands thou be nothing to see poor old miss i do know what you say trouble trouble but the mistress of sydenham plantation had a way of speaking but seldom and of rarely listening to what any one was pleased to say in return out of the mistiness of her clouded brain a thought had come with unwonted clearness she must go to the island her husband and sons were detained at a distance it was the time of year to look after corn and cotton she must attend to her house and her slaves the remembrance of that news of battle and of the three deaths that had left her widowed and childless had faded away in the illness it had brought she never comprehended her loss she was like one bewitched into indifference she remembered something of her youth and kept the simple routine of daily life and that was all i thought she'd done forget everything groaned peter again oh lord have mercy on old miss the landing-place on ladies island was steep and sandy and the oarsman watched peter help the strange passenger up the ascent with a sense of pleasant relief he pushed off a little way into the stream for better self-defence at the top of the bluff was a rough shed built for shelter and peter looked about him eagerly while his mistress stood expectant and imperious in the shade of a pride of india tree that grew among the live oaks and pines of a wild thicket he was wretched with a sense of her discomfort though she gave no sign of it he had learned to know by instinct all that was unspoken in the old times she would have found four oarsmen waiting with a cushioned boat at the ferry she would have found a saddle-horse or a carriage ready for her on ladies island for the five miles journey but the carriage had not come the poor gray-headed old man recognized her displeasure he was her only slave left if she did but know it for god's sake give me some kind of cup old miss she done wake up and mean to go out to suddenham dis day urged peter who dis hoss and cart in de shed who make dis trap wid hoofs just now like dey done right by you'll go get somebody for me or she be right mad sure the elderly guardian of the shed who was also the old regime hobbled away quickly and backed out a steer that was broken to harness and a rickety two-wheeled cart their owner had left them there for some hours and had crossed the ferry to beaufort old mistress must be obeyed and they looked toward her beseechingly where she was waiting deprecating her disapproval of this poor apology for a conveyance the lady long since had ceased to concern herself with the outward shapes of things she accepted this possibility of carrying out her plans and they lifted her light figure to the chair in the cart's end while peter mounted before her with all a coachman's dignity he once had his ambitions of being her coachman and they moved slowly away through the deep sand my god almighty look out for us now said peter over and over oh miss she done forget good lord she done forget how de good massa up dere done took from her everything she spec now she find suddenham all de same likes it was fo de war she ain't no bout what's been since day of de gun shoot on port royal and dar away oh lord almighty you know how you stove her po head with dem gun shoot be easy to old miss but as peter pleaded 
in the love and sorrow of his heart the lady who sat behind him was unconscious of any cause for grief some sweet vagaries in her own mind were matched to the loveliness of the day all her childhood spent among the rustic scenes of these fertile sea islands was yielding for her now an undefined pleasantness of association the straight-stemmed palmettos stood out with picturesque clearness against the great level fields with their straight furrows running out of sight figures of men and women followed the furrow paths slowly here were men and horses bending to the ploughshare and there women and children sowed with steady hand the rich seed of their crops there were touches of colour in the head kerchiefs there were sounds of songs as the people worked not gay songs of the evening but some repeated line of a hymn to steady the patient feet and make the work go faster the unconscious music of the blacks who sing as the beetle drones or the cricket chirps slowly under the dry grass it had a look of permanence this cotton planting it was a thing to paint to relate itself to the permanence of art an everlasting duty of mankind terrible if a thing of force and compulsion and for another's gain but the birthright of the children of adam and not unrewarded nor unnatural when one drew by it one's own life from the earth peter glanced through the hedgerows furtively this way and that what would his mistress say to the cabins that were scattered all about the fields now and that were no longer put together in the long lines of the quarters he looked down the deserted lane where he well remembered fifty cabins on each side of the way it was gay there of a summer evening the old times had not been without their pleasures and the poor old man's heart leapt with the vague delight of his memories he had never been on the block he was born and bred at old sydenham he had been trusted in house and field i done like dem old times de best ventures peter presently to his unresponding companion dey was good bout dem times i see i like de old times good as any young folks may be a change for me he was growing gray in the face with apprehension he did not dare to disobey the slow-footed beast of burden was carrying them towards sydenham step by step and he dreaded the moment of arrival he was like a mesmerized creature who can only obey the force of a directing will but under pretence of handling the steer's harness he got stiffly to the ground to look at his mistress he could not turn to face her as he sat in the cart he could not drive any longer and feel her there behind him the silence was too great it was a relief to see her placid face and to see even a more youthful look in its worn lines she had been a very beautiful woman in her young days and a solemn awe fell upon peter's tender heart lest the veil might be lifting from her hidden past and there alone with him on the old plantation she would die of grief and pain god only knew what might happen the old man mounted to his seat and again they plodded on peter said the mistress he was always frightened when she spoke peter we must hurry i was late in starting i have a great deal to do urge the horses yes miss yes miss and peter laughed aloud nervously and brandished his sassafras switch while the steer hastened a little they had come almost to the gates who are these the stately wayfarer asked once as they met some persons who gazed at them in astonishment i spect dem de good ladies from de north would come down to show de colored folks how to do readin answered peter bravely it do look kind of comfortable over here he added wistfully half to himself he could not understand even now how oblivious she was of the great changes on st helena's there were curious eyes watching from the fields and here by the roadside an aged black woman came to her cabin door lo exclaimed peter what can i do now and old sibyl she's done crazy too and they'll be mischievous together the steer could not be hurried past and sibyl came and leaned against the wheel mornin mistis said sibyl 
and yo too peter how's all day of judgment's comin in mornin some nice buttermilk i done get rich dat's my cow and she pointed to the field and chuckled peter felt as if his brain were turning bless de lord i no more slave said old sibyl looking up with impudent scrutiny at her old mistress's impassive face you know mars middleton what yo buy me fun he my foster brother we push away from same breast he got trouble poor gentleman he sorry to sell sibyl he give me silver dollar dat day and feel bad never mind i say i get good mistis young mistis at sydenham i like her well i did so i picked my two hundred pound all days and i ain't whipped too bad so me poor mons middleton but he in trouble he done come see me last plantin sibyl went on proudly oh god he grown old and poor lookin he come in just in dat dope and he say sibyl i long and long to see you and now i see you and he kiss and kiss me and dare's one wide river of jordan and we'll soon be there black and white i was right glad i see old mars middleton for i die the old creature poured forth the one story of her great joy and pride she had told it a thousand times it had happened not the last planting but many plantings ago it remained clear when everything else was confused there was no knowing what she might say next she began to take the strange steps of a slow dance and peter urged his steer forward while his mistress said suddenly good-bye sibyl i am glad you are doing so well with a strange irrelevancy of graciousness it was in the old days before the war that sibyl had fallen insensible one day in the cotton field did her mistress think that it was still that year and peter's mind could not puzzle out this awful day of anxiety they turned at last into the live oak avenue they had only another half mile to go and here in the place where the lady had closest association her memory was suddenly revived almost to clearness she began to hurry peter impatiently it was a mischance that she had not been met at the ferry she was going to see to putting the house in order and the women were all waiting it was autumn and they were going to move over from beaufort it was spring next moment and she had to talk with her overseers the old imperiousness flashed out did not peter know that his master was kept at the front and the young gentlemen were with him and their regiment was going into action it was a blessing to come over and forget it all but peter must drive drive they had taken no care of the avenue how the trees were broken in the storm the house needed they were going to move the next day but one and nothing was ready a party of gentlemen were coming from charleston in the morning they passed the turn of the avenue they came out to the open lawn and the steer stopped and began to browse peter shook from head to foot he climbed down by the wheel and turned his face slowly old miss he said feebly old miss she was looking off into space the cart jerked as it moved after the feeding steer the mistress of sydenham plantation had sought her home in vain the crumbled fallen chimneys of the house were there among the weeds and that was all on christmas day and easter day many an old man and woman come into st helena's church who are not seen there the rest of the year there are not a few recluses in the parish who come to listen to their teacher and to the familiar prayers read with touching earnestness and simplicity as one seldom hears the prayers read anywhere this easter morning dawned clear and bright as easter morning should the fresh bloomed roses and lilies were put in their places there was no touch of paid hands anywhere and the fragrance blew softly about the church as you sat in your pew you could look out through the wide open doors and see the drooping branches and the birds as they sat singing on the gravestones the sad faces of the old people the cheerful faces of the young passed by up the aisle one figure came to sit alone in one of the pews 
to bend its head in prayer after the ancient habit peter led her as usual to the broad aisle doorway and helped her stumbling himself up the steps and many eyes filled with tears as his mistress went to her place even the tragic moment of yesterday was lost already in the acquiescence of her mind as the calm sea shines back to the morning sun when another wreck has gone down End of the mistress of sydenham plantation by sarah orne jewett morning glory by mary e wilkins from understudies harper and brothers new york nineteen o one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perrard morning glory by mary e wilkins all over the stone wall in front of the bemis house the morning glories thrived and not only there but on the trellis work over the east door they even trailed along the ground their garlands of purple and rosy and white blossoms when support failed them the morning glory prefers a prop for her tender growth but such is her rapture of youth and morning that she blossoms anywhere from the face of the rock from the depths of the dewy grass from tree and trellis prone in the dust of the highway at the mercy of the feet of men the morning glories shout out their great silent chorus of triumph through a hundred trumpets of delicate bloom the morning glories had always been a distinctive feature of the bemis place madame bemis as she was called was very fond of them madame bemis was the daughter of old squire bemis and she had married her own cousin the son of minister bemis now squires were out of date and even ministers of as many years settlement as her husband's father had lost prestige but there was still recognition on the part of the villagers for the descendants of such notables hence the madame bemis they were emulous of her notice and they had a pride which was like feudal loyalty in alexander alexander's father had died when he was a child too young to remember him clearly the little boy always had a face appear to his mental vision whenever the dead man's name was mentioned but whether it was true or not he never knew this vision was not in the least like a portrait of his father done crudely in oil which hung in the best parlor this portrait represented his father as a very young boy with a face as puffed out with the wind of innocent gaiety as a cherub's he was dressed in the artlessly grotesque fashion of a former generation in an awkward little nankeen suit with a wide frill around the neck and strapped shoes i could never see the least resemblance to your father after he was grown up in that portrait alexander's mother used to say but i suppose he must have been like that when he was a child for a good artist painted it your father never looked in the least like you alexander when madame bemis said that she would gaze up at her son with a perfect assent of admiration with which she had never gazed at his father her married life had not been altogether satisfactory to her her husband had been something of a disappointment he was very much a bemis as was she and there had been a constant wearying echoing of family traits i wish addison when you lose your temper you would not lose it in exactly the same way that i do she told her husband once the tastes of the two had been so similar that they gave rise to that curious discord which may result from harmony with such an identity of hereditary tastes there was at once a loss of individuality and a maddening intensifying of it as in a convex mirror and the result was either weariness or a monstrous egotism in the woman's case it was weariness in the man's egotism the woman when her son came had for the first time in her life a distinct interest in something outside herself and yet belonging to her 
she did not have to admire or dislike in the child her own appearance and traits or her husband's he was essentially different from both parents or appeared to be so certainly he differed from them physically both alexander's parents were small with fair hair and he was exactly the reverse madame bemis said that he resembled her own father who had not been a true bemis but had inherited from the mother's side my father was the first dark bemis who ever lived so far as i know she said and he was like my grandmother who was a moral and was said to have indian blood alexander seems more like father than he does like me or his own father then madame bemis concluded as she always concluded everything all her paragraphs of life with as it were a little tailpiece of a look of boundless admiration at alexander alexander was accustomed to that look and not on his mother's face alone everybody whom he met looked at him in that fashion he was never at any time particularly elated by it he merely acquiesced in it as his rightful due and had done so from the first alexander had been a very precocious child and not in the least slow to recognize his own relation to his environments long before people thought that he understood when they talked before his face of his beauty and brilliancy he was fully alive to the situation oh that baby can't understand what we say one woman replied to another who remonstrated with her for her outspoken admiration in the presence of the child he doesn't know what a beauty he is do he, darling but alexander who could speak few words and understood many and who besides had as keen an intelligence for variations of voice and expressions of face as a dog would look at her with his wonderful contemplative black eyes and understand perfectly he knew that he was a beautiful marvellous little boy that no other child in the village could equal him and everybody admired him he used to view his small image in the mirror with no vanity but entire comprehension of its beauty there had really never been such a beautiful child as alexander in the village or perhaps in the state there was something about that noble gentle little face lighted with those great black stars of eyes and that little figure full of the touching majesty of innocence and childhood which made a woman's heart ache with love and desire and a man's with ambition and desire that boy is going to be something if he lives they said they repeated his bright sayings which were many he was a talented child when he went to school he soon outstripped those of his own age and graduated the youngest of his class and was ready for college at seventeen madame bemis went to college with alexander she could not bear her beautiful noble son to be long out of her sight the bemis place was shut up during the long terms and madame bemis lived in the college town and made a home for alexander but when the morning glories were in blossom the two were home again and alexander resplendent with new clothes and new stature and new knowledge was passing in and out of the east door under the trellis purple and rosy and white with the trumpet-shaped flowers the admiration of alexander grew and grew he was making a brilliant record at college he seemed to be moving on an ascendant scale in everything mind looks and attainments people began to think that he might in time become almost anything representative senator perhaps even president at least governor of the state his mother had the fullest faith in it there is no reason why you cannot be anything that you want to be alexander she would say and alexander would flash upon her one of his brilliant contemplative looks and make no dissent there was in reality something sublime in the boy's consciousness of his own power it was completely removed from vanity it was a simple ingenuous recognition of the truth alexander bemis does think he's awful smart said one sharp-tongued dissenting young girl to another who retorted well he is awful smart i would rather he didn't know it said the first 
then he wouldn't be bright said the other alexander was worshipped afar off by the young girls of the village but he made a sweetheart of none of them until he had graduated from college he came home laden with honors he had won prize after prize he had been mentioned in the newspapers madame bemis was so proud of him that life was to her like a triumphal march if the church bell in this little new england village which never rang in the interest of any individual unless his house was on fire or he was on his way to his tomb had pealed for joy when alexander came home from college she would have considered it quite appropriate what demonstration in greeting of such magnificent promise as that of her son could be out of place however although the bell was not rung alexander was made much of in his native village young as he was he was elected a member of the school committee and was made chairman of the selectmen at every public meeting he was called upon as our talented and promising young townsman to speak he sat upon the platform with the local dignitaries his name pranked out with laudatory adjectives appeared often in the local paper alexander at that time could scarcely sit down or stand up or eat his breakfast but it was made the subject of admiring chronicle he could not speak without a listening hush he held undisputed moral sway over the whole village but his head was not in the least turned he bore all his honors with the magnificent ease and unconcern of one born to a crown the year after alexander graduated amanda Doan came to live in the village her father was a rich manufacturer who bought out the little factory and established a gigantic plant which might in time convert the small town into a city his daughter was a beauty of a coarse emphatic type not a line wavered not a color was indeterminate her loud clear voice never faltered in the expression of her opinions alexander lost his heart to her at once the village people quite approved of the match but madame bemis hesitated for the first time a doubt as to whether the king could not do wrong seized her when her son told her of his engagement she looked at him uncertainly why what is the matter mother alexander asked with wonder she is not like the women of our family madame bemis replied falteringly alexander laughed she is a lady at heart he replied and as for the rest she can acquire it not that i am not entirely satisfied he added generously but amanda Doan acquired nothing she remained a fact settled and incontrovertible her period for receptivity had passed although she was still young her character had formed and developed to a perfect flower of resistance to all outside influence the engagement was not to be a long one the wedding day was set then one afternoon amanda appeared at the bemis house such was her almost brutal directness of action when her mind had once formed a purpose that she came rather than send for alexander i don't care if you stay in the room said she to madame bemis i would just as soon you heard then she confronted the two the splendid young fellow and his adoring mother and made her little speech which was full of revolutionary eloquence it was the revolt of a daughter of the people of the modern conditions of things against all inactive superiority the girl did not speak good english but she spoke with a force which made her own language now you look at here alexander bemis said she i've promised to marry you and i'm most ready clothes all bought and everything i don't know what you will say and i don't know what folks will say and i can't help it and i don't care i'm going to back out i've got to look out for myself and my father's money that he's worked so hard to get without a dollar to start with i'm going to back out i've liked you and i like you now and it ain't none too easy for me and i've laid awake some nights thinking of it but it's better for both of us i ain't going to marry you you're good and steady and handsome and you're awful smart but you ain't done anything but talk smart and look smart and be smart 
you ain't never acted smart and i don't believe you ever will you haven't done anything you've just laid right back on your reputation and that's what you're going to do right along i'd rather have a man with less smartness than you that can use what little he's got there's no use i'm going to back out the girl's voice broke a little there were tears in her indignant blue eyes her red lips pouted into sobs which she resolutely restrained alexander towered over her pale and magnificent and quite silent his mother shrank into a little faintly breathing wide-eyed heap in a corner of the sofa amanda pulled the engagement ring a little ancient pearl hoop an heirloom in the bemis family from her finger here said she here's your ring i'll always wish you well alexander took the ring between a long thumb and forefinger amanda's were short and stubbed and looked at it then at the girl with a sort of pained and stately acquiescence very well amanda he replied quite calmly but his lips were white gentlemen born and bred diametrically different by nature and training he had been very fond of this girl who defied with her coarse but splendid vigour all laws and rules of growth and advance to which she did not herself subscribe why ain't the kind of english i speak as good as yours she had demanded of him once they would always have spoken two languages had they lived together for a lifetime but that had not seemed of much moment to him she had perhaps supplied some inherent need of his nature and been to him a sort of spiritual trellis work which had been essential for his future growth be that as it may after amanda doane deserted him he retrograded further and still further from his early promise though that might have happened in any case amanda soon married a young manufacturer who went into business with her father alexander used often to see her driving in her smart trap with her keen-looking alert husband by her side later on he saw her with a small brood of children who were the children of her time as well who raised a shrill babel of voices like a multiple of their mothers as time went on and alexander did no more than he had done people began gradually to lose faith in him especially after his mother died her faith had served as a prop for that of others then slowly alexander dropped and sagged away from his high estate until he lay nearly prone in his path of life yet still even there with a certain unconquerable beauty and glory no man could ever say aught against alexander bemis except that he had never done that which he had bade fair to do and had failed to keep his promise to himself he lived to be an old man old and shrunken going in and out his east door under the garlands of morning glories and people seeing him used to speak in this wise that is alexander bemis everybody used to think he was going to be something great but he never amounted to anything at all he has never done anything he used to speak in town meeting we thought he would be a daniel webster or a charles sumner and go to congress but he never did when he was young everybody thought there was nobody like him in town but he never came to anything every spring the morning glories came again and sent forth their great silent chorus of youth and victory from their hundred trumpet mouths then at noon they closed and slept and remained asleep until the next morning when they awoke again to their chorus of victory and alexander passed beneath them still old and wrecked and defeated but the day of a man is longer than that of a flower end of morning glory by mary e wilkins